Coming up in the Innovation Sandbox today, we're discussing intelligent by design. Are you taking the right approach to your enterprise AI strategy? How much of your data are you actually using to make critical corporate decisions? What provocative questions? We'll explore these exciting topics with two of our greatest minds, live in 30 seconds. So grab your shovel, prepare to dig in to this week's episode of the Innovation Sandbox. Artificial intelligence, the final frontier. This is the 30 minute voyage of the prolific innovation sandbox. Okay, well, maybe it's not the final frontier, but it is one of the most important topics in business and IT today. And I can guarantee Captain Kirk would wanna beam down to the surface to explore it much deeper. So to take us on this journey, I have two of the greatest minds inside of prolific joining me today. First up, we've got Dr. Michael Gonzalez, who much like Dr. Spock, has a massive brain wired for advanced analytics. And a regular guest, Innovation Sandbox co-host, Mr. Innovation himself, Greg Hodgkinson. Guys, I can just hear the virtual standing ovation from the crowd coming through my speakers right now. <laughs> Intelligent by design, what does it really mean? It's simple. The key to growing your business successfully navigating disruption and ensuring constant customer delight is locked away in your data. Tap into your own personal goldmine of data, infuse it into your business, and allow AI to help you chart out the right way forward. But before you go down this path, a solid AI strategy is a must, or you can get easily lost in the jungle of tools, tools, and more tools. I can tell you, it's worse than lions, tigers, and bears. So without further ado, Dr. G and Greg, join me on the bridge of the Starship Innovation, and let's get innovating. And folks, as always, make sure you type your questions for our panel in the live chat. It's at the right or the bottom of your screen. We will have plenty of time at the end for Q&A. So folks, at this point in the sandbox, we normally jump into an open panel discussion, but today we're gonna do things a little bit differently. Dr. G is gonna put on his readers and take us to class. Because in order to move forward, sometimes it helps to take a short step back to the basics. Dr. G, the class is ready. Thank you, Matt. <clears throat> so we have a, a graphic up, which is just a standard graphic that anybody can Google out there. And I just, I, I wanna ground uh, any conversation in AI with reality. <clears throat> so let's just look at it from the perspective of, you know, where does this term come from? Where does it fit in the scheme of things, right? Because AI isn't a new term, but it seems like, you know, I'm 64 years old. It seems like I've lived through a couple of hyper cycles of AI just surfacing. You know, it's like marketing run amok. So let's just kind of ground ourselves first. So in, in this first image that you see, uh, we have computer science is basically the big wrapper. Then you have artificial intelligence is everything within that wrapper. And in AI itself, there are a few types of AI. So what you see up is weak AI, which is really what we've been practicing for you know, several decades. And it's also referred to as narrow. And you have strong AI or general AI. There is another couple of categories of AI, which I think is normally associated with, with artificial intelligence. But those are, mostly, those are mostly theoretical still, and they have to do with theory of mind and self-awareness, right? Which is basically still theoretical. So really what we're stuck with in AI, not stuck with because it's just great technology, but what, what we mostly execute is reactive machines. In other words, I make a quick prediction, I send it data, it gives me a response and then some limited memory uh, learning. Uh, so those are the two types that we normally uh, have been seen executed to date. And then underneath uh, weak AI, we have machine learning. 
so machine learning has been around for decades as well. And there's a couple of categories of machine learning that we'll talk about here in a second, supervised and unsupervised. And then within all of those concentric circles sits a nugget called deep learning. And I think most people associate AI and deep learning together, you know, and <clears throat> I, I, I just wanna make sure that we clearly understand, you know, what's available for us today without having to go out and, you know, try to do dancing robots or whatever out there. So let's talk a little bit. Let's, uh, if you could just click on the first, uh, uh, I, um, image that comes up is uh, uh, credit risk, good or bad. That's an example of machine learning that is supervised. This is stuff we do day in and day out. We can do extremely well. We have best practices. You know, this is the kind of stuff we should be able to do all the time. So in this case, uh, it's credit risk. Is this a good credit risk or a bad credit risk? Uh, if we click next, then there's stuff for um, uh, unsupervised learning. So let me just kind of regress a bit. In supervised learning, we take historical data that we already know whether their person is a good risk or a bad risk. We already know if they paid off their loan correctly or didn't. So we take that data and whatever predictors and we train a model to basically identify whether a person is a good risk or bad risk based on that historical data. And once that model is trained, we point it out to the raw data and allow it to go out there and say, hey, this is a good risk or this is a bad risk. So it's trained on existing data where we already know what the answer is. The unsupervised is not trained. These are models that you throw at a heap of data and ask it to go find something. So in the case of market basket analysis, I might have you know, millions of point of sale tickets and I'll throw an association algorithm at it and it'll go, it comes back and tells me the stuff that you've often heard like uh, wine and cheese are often sold in the same basket or uh, uh, milk and eggs are often sold in the same basket. Well, how we come to those conclusions is using unsupervised models that can go out there and find um, significant relationships in all of the millions of point of sale tickets we have. <clears throat> and then the final one is the deep learning model. So a good example uh, that everybody can relate to is natural language understanding. So that's a good example of a robust deep learning model. Now these are large models, uh, require oftentimes lots of data. Although I, I saw, just as an anecdote, I saw a blogger he was saying that you don't have to have a lot of data out there to create a deep learning model. He was bragging about uh, it. He took 20 pictures of two different types of fish and he has 100% accuracy. Just in those parameters alone, I would not have run out and published that information uh, out loud to anybody. That is that that is like an overtrained model and usually 100% prediction is like really wrong. Something's definitely wrong. Most deep learning models do require, at least the ones that we see now, do require a lot of data, a, a lot of data. I can't say how much, to, I'm not trying to be coy, it's just, it requires a lot of data. A common one that we all leverage, for instance, in, in NLU, is most of the recent, I, uh, there was a statistic out there, uh, it was a 2019 statistic that said, in the last 12 months, most NLU natural language understanding models are leveraging a model that Google built, which is called BERT. Doesn't matter, there's a new one called Albert and there's Roberta, there's all kinds of versions of it. Anyway, they, they're, they're basing their research on natural language processing using or leveraging Google's model. Why? Because it takes mountains of data to train one really well. And so there's oftentimes a reuse of existing models out there or pre-trained models is a way to look at it because it just takes a lot of data. So that's kind of a uh, just a kind of just a distinction, right? So there's machine learning. We have supervised models, uh, unsupervised models, and then deep learning is a subset of machine learning. And I gave you an example, you know, of uh, of a deep learning uh, or a, nat a natural language understanding model. So let's break this down just a little bit further. So if you can click on next. 
I described essentially how a supervised model learns, right? So we're talking about linear regression models for making predictions or classification models like decision trees and just kind of, I use this term a lot, but just kind of meat and potatoes models that we have a lot of great experience in executing. We have a lot of great practice in executing. <clears throat> you take your historical data, half of it, or not half of it, it just depends on the ratio, but you're gonna take part of that data, you're gonna train your model, then you're gonna take another part of that data and you're gonna test it to see how good it is. If you click next, <clears throat> the deep learning model uh, operates essentially the same, although it can adjust itself as well. Now, I wanna, the reason I brought those both up is I've had people thinking that deep learning models just become aware somehow, just like magically you put them out there and you know they start absorbing data. That's not how it works at all. I mean, it, you have to have a, you know, a well-designed idea of what you wanna do with those kind of models. And you need to have typically a lot of data to train them correctly so that you can generalize them and they're, and they're applicable. And there's nothing that just is become self-aware. You know, you take a lot of historical data and you train it. <clears throat> so I just wanna make sure that we all understand how these models actually exist. The idea of, uh, you know, hell on 2001, you know, talking to you and rationalizing with you, that just doesn't happen. It's not, you know, if a business executive thinks that they're gonna talk to Siri and say, you know, how do I, you know, how do I turn my business around and Siri's gonna give them some reasonable response? It's just not there. But what's there, um, Matt and uh, Greg, is a mountain of proven solid AI that we can execute today and, and improve the competitiveness of any organization. And we're just talking about those supervised models, reactive machine learning, limited memory, those types of uh, AI, narrow AI, that we can absolutely leverage today without having dancing robots or you know, whatever the latest and greatest driving cars are. So well, Dr. that's, G, my, I got that's a question my class. <laughs> Well, okay. I mean, it's, it's perfect because you ended it beautifully. Um, I got a question for you and Greg pile on as well, um, you know, on, under the answer. So, I mean, really, I mean, you'd be hard pressed to find any IT study of top trends for the next five plus years that doesn't tell us AI is critical to every organization's success. Um, there was a recent IDC study uh, that talked about only 35% of organizations have analytical models fully deployed into their production. So with all of that, with what you said and, and how you ended your, uh, your, your class, how do we get from where we are today to where AI is actually being effectively utilized across the organization? So I'm gonna look at it from a couple of different perspectives. Um, and I reserve the right to expand my perspective as the discussion goes. Well, let's talk about some fundamentals. There was a study that suggested that if you had quality data, governed data, you could double the value of your analysis. So those companies that have quality data, governed data could double the value, double the value, as opposed or compared to those companies who don't. And a good amount of the stuff that I do in data science, we spend an inordinate amount of time data we call it data wrangling, which is just like a wonderful phrase. I love the phrase data wrangling, but it basically means we've got a, a pile of stuff in several different places that we have to kind of rationalize, clean up, you know, make sure that it's all you know, normalized and, and, and properly modeled or shaped, I should say, we'll use the term shaped, so that I can actually do my data science. So that amount of time is huge. You know, there's, there, there's statistics out there that will support maybe 80% of a data scientist's time is horsing around with data, just horsing around with the data. So to your point about data and innovate and, and intelligent by design, it's well-founded. On the other end of the spectrum is really properly applying data science. Uh, I don't know that a lot of executives understand enough about data science to actually leverage their data science team appropriately. And I, I, and I, I feel for the data science geeks, they're given assignments that aren't really even data science centric or that 
really the data hasn't really been fully uh, identified even before they, they are, they're tasked to try to do some predictive analytics. So they spend a lot of time going back and looking at all the stuff to even see if they've got the, the right ingredients to get the stuff, uh, to get the stuff done. So data and the right application of our data science uh, teams, I think are two important factors that are prohibiting companies from fully exercising those as competitive advantage. Yeah, <clears throat> and yeah, so that, that is critically important, but um, I'll add to what Dr. G is saying. The first thing that I'll make sure that um, business leaders understand, they may be wondering, is I even relevant? I mean, is it relevant in, I think there's a thinking that analytics is something and data science is happens in the back of the house um, within an organization. And it's a bunch of geeks that massage, wrangle the data, and they might provide some magical reports that will help the business um, improve the way they're, they're executing. AI is very much front of house. It's out there with your customers. And AI is bringing interventions that can make very real differences to your customer's experience uh, of your business. So it's very much, again, so if you're thinking, is AI relevant to me? It absolutely is. Um, the reason AI is so relevant, and, and I always like to think of AI going back to the fact that software is about automating things. And if you're in business nowadays, you've got software all over the place. And again, if you're thinking, where in all of the software do I need to be injecting some AI? It's pretty much everywhere it can make a difference, right? Um, and what AI can do that we haven't been able to do in the past is I've got this lovely saying that's lived with me for many years um, from, a, from a customer that worked at a long time ago. Uh, there was a guy that, that the customer would always ask, they'd come up with really interesting things they wanted to do. And they, they'd ask this guy, you know, can you do this? And he'd say, well, it's just software. It can do anything. You know, literally, I can write code that can do anything. But the problem is you've got to reach limits to how much code you can write to solve the kinds of problems we're solving with AI nowadays. And the magical thing with AI is instead of having to code everything up, I mean, you could code up the rules to give the business decisions that Dr. G mentioned. You can code up rules to even go and look at photographs and figure out what it is in the photograph. They can be incredibly complex. Why code those when you can just use AI to solve that problem? And AI teaches itself from the data. You've got spans of it. Uh, and, and it just makes, and also the world's always changing. You coded up all those rules. AI, you need to recode them once the world changes. So AI is fantastic at, at just relearning and, and uh, being able to move with the data. So guys, this is awesome because I didn't provide you guys these questions ahead of time, uh, but it's like you, you're in my head and uh, you, you've sort of predicted what, what I was gonna ask you next. So on the back of what you just said, Greg, um, the title of the Sandbox episode is Intelligent by Design. Uh, an AI strategy, it's not, it's not a vertical, it's a horizontal approach. It's got to go across everything a business does, you know, whether it's, you know, app, you know, app creation, um, integration, business automation, BI, and so much more. You are doing a lot of work in the prolific innovation sandbox and in, in the innovation center. So how are you incorporating or embedding AI into all of our assets and into all of our engagements with our customers? Yep. So, again, I agree with you 100%. AI can make a difference pretty much across the organization. There's this, there's this phrase that gets used nowadays of total experience um, and business having a focus on total experience. And total experience is both the experience that your customers have, but as well as the experience that your staff have, your employees have, um, and all the different modes that they interact with the software that you have in your organization. So, we've definitely embraced that and said, looking at AI, how can AI, um, what innovations can we explore with AI that are making a difference to the end customer, you know, your, your cust our customers' customers? Um, and then what difference can we also use AI to make a difference to the employees and IT and really where can we, where can we leverage AI? So we've got a few things, you know, we've got loads of things we've worked on. I'll, I'll limit it to just a couple. Um, in the healthcare space, we've done some very interesting, I mean, healthcare is huge with AI. Um, and what we've been doing there is we've worked on um, standards, you know, data standards that are becoming popular in the healthcare industry now, um, which are increasing the amount of data that gets shared between different organizations in the healthcare ecosystem, uh, and how we can, once we get our hands on all this data, we can push it into a 
integration hub that allows us to both share that data internally and with our partners, but as well as feed and inject into AI models, um, which allow you to optimize your business, provide better healthcare to your customers. Uh, I mean, really, it's limitless the different uses that you can apply AI to, even just within the healthcare context. Uh, I know Dr. G is going to jump in on this one, but Dr. G has gotten involved in this topic in the Innovation Center. And part of it is even you know, for a healthcare company that is able to make interventions into their customers' buying habits, um, you know, going into a store and I'm faced with a healthy choice and some unhealthy choices. Um, what if we, right at that point in time, could make an intervention with this data that we have that intervenes in that, customer, that person's experience in a store or online based on what we know about them and help them make the right decisions, just nudge them in the right direction to improve their health care. So I mean, that's a very kind of different application of healthcare data, but really it's a, there's a wide set of different applications that we can use once we have that data um, available. From a healthcare perspective, uh, you know, uh, Greg, I think that we need to really embrace the whole IoT thing, you know, so I'm a big fan of making the customer experience from online to brick and mortar to make it more of a seamless type of uh, interaction, right? Right now, a lot of people might order their uh, subscriptions uh, via online, and then they walk down to their, you know, their local uh, uh, pharmacy uh, and make sure, and then and they and they fill that and they pick up their their order from that local pharmacy, but we almost always engage those as two distinct isolated uh, uh, ecosystems, but AI would allow us to blend all of those together and give that customer experience, have one customer experience, one customer journey, so that we can, we can better uh, provide a, a customer service. We could do pr uh, target marketing, kind of personalization. I think there's a lot of opportunity there uh, across online and brick and mortar as well for the healthcare, and actually any actual retail environment. And actually, so just oh, to follow up from that, so sort of briefly follow up from that, so AI even helps there because AI allows us to tie together those people, that, that person that's come into a store versus but, that person but, that's online. And that's not unique to healthcare in this example. That's all over the place. How, how do you figure out whether you've got the same person that you're dealing with and obviously, if you're able to join up the data sets that you have on an individual, you're much, you're much better able to serve them. But I, I want to qualify something, though. The AI that you're talking about is stuff that's probably 10 years matured I mean, at, at a minimum, right? A lot of those algorithms are much older. But just the IoT piece, you know, let's say maybe it's 10, 15 years matured. All of those are not like brand new dancing robot AI. I always, I worry about our executives. What if, if an executive, not our executives, but if, if a client comes to me and they say, they, you know, are we doing enough AI? I oftentimes need to, uh, the, my, first, my first inclination is I need to get context about what they think AI is, right? Did they just come off the golf course because some vendor is pitching AI? You know, we got a new AI solution. So they come in and they want to do AI. Well, you know, we have mountains of AI that we can implement that's proven, probably you already have invested in the technology. It's just a question of are you implementing it correctly, right? So I, I'm always worried about putting AI in context uh, with our clients, right? So hey, guys. So um, I'll tell you what. I mean, so this is, this is a perfect time for us to transition to Q&A because we've got a question that just came in that is exactly the question I was about to ask you guys. So, um, so everybody, we're going to move over to the Q&A session. So if you have a question for this brilliant panel, me excluded, um, please type it in the live chat. It's on the right or the bottom of your screen, and we will answer as many questions as we possibly have time for. So let's dive into it. So guys, put on your innovation hats. Not like you guys ever take it off. Um, but, you know, I got a question for both of you. And once again, this is exactly a question that just came into, um, into our chat window. So companies need to be constantly innovating, disrupt or be disrupted. So how do we help organization, organizations leverage the power of their data to help them constantly innovate and stay competitive? 
Well, I would like to take a first whack at that. Um, we do a vision workshop. <clears throat> I wanna go back to actually applying your data scientists correctly. The executives really have to understand, that sounds like demanding. We would like to help educate our, our clients um, to the landscape of, of what is available under AI data science. What does that actually bring to the table? And, and more importantly, in that vision workshop, we actually will introduce what your competitors are doing. You know, what are, if, if your competitors can do that, likely you can do it as well, right? So it's it really, I think executives need to better understand how to leverage their existing data science teams. Uh, their existing, probably they're heavily invested in technology that could do some great uh, data science and AI. They just need to better leverage it. There, it's not uncommon to find corporations with a heavy investment in leading technology for advanced analytics, and they're using it for standard reporting. I mean, that's really, that's, you know, that's probably the most expensive standard report you're ever gonna produce, right? You're not really leveraging that platform for what it's intended to be, right? So just helping the, uh, the clients understand the landscape and then start thinking out of the box, right? What is the industry doing? What is the market doing? Uh, and, and, and helping to guide them with understanding, you know, what are some great data science, AI type of opportunities in their organization? It's called the vision workshop. Yeah, and to, to so take, Greg. I mean, so the next step from that would be, so I agree with Dr. G, that's the starting point. Take inspiration what from other people are doing out there. You know, that, that really will open your eyes to what you can achieve with AI. Uh, before I move to what we do next, as an example, I mean, again, to this point of AI, can you need to think about intelligently designing AI into pretty much all of your systems. You may think that, well, this is just a website. Facebook is just a website, right? Look at all the different ways that Facebook use AI to make the customer experience better. They use AI to screen dangerous content. They use AI to tag photographs. There's all different uses that, that Facebook get out of AI to take their experience to the next level. It's just a website. You know, Amazon's just a delivery service. Don't need to go into all the different ways that they make use of AI to make their business work. But once you've got that inspiration, you need to start looking at, well, what are the experiences we want to innovate inside our company? So again, whether they're custom experiences, whether they are internal employee experiences, um, and whether it's optimization, you know, you need to look at those experiences and we will work with the customer to come up with some hypotheses, which says, if we use AI in this way, we're gonna get this kind of business benefits. And then straight away, you prototype that. So you jump in and this should be pretty quick. You jump in, you do some prototyping to make sure that you explore that idea. If we do this, are we getting that kind of business benefits? Um, as soon as you, you see that your prototypes are starting to get you in the right direction, you start implementing into to live production systems. And all of this is done in very quick sort of design thinking style life cycles. So that you can quickly go from your, you know, the inspiration, the idea, coming up with those ideas, um, coming up with hypotheses as to how that's going to give value in your company, prototyping it, and we can get those prototypes created incredibly quickly. As Dr. G said, we're not talking about rocket science here, although I do think what Dr. G does is rocket science sometimes. <laughs> this is, to use his phrase, meat and potato AI. I mean, this is stuff that's been around for years, and it's there's often just money left on the table in terms of business benefit that you're not getting today just because you haven't gone through this kind of process but you've really thought about where you can get that benefits and then quickly start building that into your systems. Excellent. So guys, I think I've got time for just one more question. And uh, humorously enough, you know, I know I put in here that uh, people should put the, uh, their questions in the chat. Someone actually sent me a text, beauty of my um, Apple Watch. So governance, risk and compliance risk and, and, and all the regulations that are out there. Um, you know, it, it's every industry has a mountain of regulations and it's only gonna continue to pile up. You know, whether it's, you know, state and local regulations or the federal government pushing regulations out. Um, how could AI be leveraged to be able to sort of alleviate, um, you know, some of that risk, predict, um, you know, help organizations address those mandates? So I'll, I'll get to start on this one. The great thing about governance or the compliance kind of problem is that it's a non-creative problem. The, the regulation 
is cast in stone. AI is fantastic at solving those kinds of problems where it's very well stated. You know exactly what kind of um, outcome you're looking for. Um, you just, you know, there's no creativity required from a person. You just need someone to automate the enforcement and the, the you know, looking into that problem. So there's, there's all kinds of roles that AI could have. So it could be from just finding out where your data is. So where's all my private data um, within an organization? That is a task that um, if you do it manually would be a full-time job. AI has a role to play there. Once you've found that data, just making sure that it's being secured. So how do you use AI as part of your security strategy to make sure that you're detecting that people are getting into a network? Um, you know, the, the entire problem space around compliance and regulation, as I said, there's no creativity in it. Automation is ideal for solving that kind of problem. So we, with uh, compliance, uh, you know, we, we've experienced it through uh, PII, right? Personal identifying information that, you know, typical of a healthcare environment where we automate the process that says, you know, this is likely uh, some PII data that needs to be uh, addressed or, or, you know, we'll, we'll either encode it or somehow mask that kind of information. Another, another uh, uh part of that of, of your uh, your uh, statement matt or your question was about risk uh, you know amidst all of this COVID stuff we have lots to deal with the nefarious folks out there um, took lists of valid social security numbers valid people valid addresses all valid information that you know have been hacked away from whatever systems out there and they were actually going to banks and filling out the information to get the, the government help or the government assistance right through the, the pandemic. They were automatically filling them out at the bank. The bank was loading it into whatever they directed, a, re, a rechargeable uh, ATM card. And then they had their own you know, group of minions gather up all the ATM cards and you know, put them whatever. So we were asked to help predict which what kind of transaction is actually a fraudulent transaction, right? So AI obviously is a, a, a critical part of it. And none of that that we've described or none of the stuff that that's Greg described is dancing robot AI, right? This is stuff we can do day in and day out. You know, we know how to do it. We have best practices, F far smarter people than me have exercised these kind of algorithms and squeezed them down. We know how to execute, right? We know how to do this kind of stuff today. Awesome, okay. All right, you know what? This is a topic I think we could talk about for hours and hours. I think it also lends itself to the need for another innovation sandbox to dive in a little bit deeper, but um, I think that's about all the time we have today. Um, Prolifics team, thank you so much for taking the time to come play alongside me in the Innovation Sandbox. Virtual fist bump to both of you guys. And to our audience, thanks for stopping by. Keep looking forward and keep innovating.